Hey guys, it's me, Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine, and welcome to Community Conversations with Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine. It is my pleasure to introduce you, or actually invite you and welcome you to the second night of what I'm calling Education Week. Uh, this is a week I wanted to really talk more about some of the education issues that we've kind of talked about um, as we're talking about school and support for public education and other things, but we don't really talk a whole lot about. So I'm really excited because tonight, um, not only do I have a very um, esteemed guest that is an expert in her field, but She's also my cousin, so I'm, I'm <laughs> equally proud to have her here um, and share her knowledge with us. And so um, for those of you who want, um, for those of you who are watching, make sure you chime in on the chat. Say, hey, let me know who uh, that you're here. Also, please share this conversation because I think it's really important. Whether you have kids in school uh, right now or not, this is an important conversation because as we know with education, for our education system to be strong, for our community to be strong, we have got to have everybody supporting education, whether you have kids in school or not. And uh, tonight our topic is social emotional learning. And if you're like me, you hear people talk about that all the time, you might think you know what it is, but you might not really know what it is and what it means um, on a normal basis. But especially now, as we're all dealing with um, COVID, we all deal with um with trauma in different ways. And so we want to really talk about uh, what this means for our kids. So again, uh, and share the broadcast, invite your friends to join us. Um, and I want to introduce Beverly. Uh, Beverly is a distinguished educator. Uh, she has previously served as an elementary and middle school principal and a coordinator for all K through eight charter schools in Baltimore City Schools. She is an elementary school, was an elementary school teacher, assistant principal, and the founding principal of an elementary alternative school in Richland School District 2 here in Columbia. She's a sought after international education and ministry trainer and a consultant and CEO of New Directions 215 LLC. She has faithfully served superintendents, principals, and teachers, training, coaching, and supporting them in creating school environments that are conducive to effective teaching and learning. She's a retired master sergeant from the U.S. Army, and she served this country for 22 years as an administrator. Uh, she received her bachelor's of science in, from element, in elementary education from Coker College. She has two master's degrees, a master in divinity and a master's degree in, social, in school administration from Columbia International University and an education specialist degree in leadership and educational administration from Capella University. And she's currently enrolled in Columbia International University as a doctoral candidate. Um, so I'm so excited to have her here. She's received certificates. Uh, she's, uh, she has certification from the South Carolina Department of Ed as a teacher, a principal, and a superintendent. Um, and then this year, school year, she will be serving as coordinator of student wholeness. We're going to talk about that for Baltimore City Schools. Uh, we know this is a pivotal year. Um, and so I am ex very excited to have um, Beverly want to talk about things. Reggie McKnight. Hey, Reggie. Re uh, Reggie McKnight says, great topic. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, so anyway, welcome, welcome, welcome to Community Conversations, Beverly. Thank you so much for being here. I know you got a lot going on. School's about to start. So I appreciate you taking time out to talk with us. Oh, you are welcome. Anytime we get an opportunity to have conversations about our students is certainly important, and especially now with all that is going on with schools. And so thank you for having me. Oh, definitely. So let's just start real basic. Um, you know, social emotional learning. Um, although, you know, it's not necessarily a new concept, it's gotten new notoriety, I guess, in the last couple of years. I hear it, the term a whole lot. But for those of us lay people, you know, parents and people who just kind of watch the news, explain to us what is social emotional learning and, and why is that important? So social emotional learning, the term actually comes out of this organization called CASEL. It's the Collaboration for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, is what you most hear. Um, people talk about. But what SEL is, is how to teach students how to self-manage, how to be socially aware, how to problem solve, how to 
engage um, in responsible decision making and how to um, be responsible in how they engage and build relationships. And so when we talk about social emotional learning in terms of academics, it's as important as mathematics or English or science. Um, as you very well know, back in the early 90s, um, we started hearing a lot about um, people who were going to work didn't have skill sets in terms of what we identified as soft skills. They don't work with people. They don't know how to engage when they're having problems. So we started hearing about things like um, workplace shootings. We started hearing about things like um, school shooting because children and adults weren't able to process how it is we cope, right? And so they resort to violence, um, unfortunately. But social emotional learning became an extremely important part of education when this organization back in 1994 um, formed this collaboration. And it's so important that school districts across the country, and so that's why we probably hear about it a lot more now, school districts across the country have come up with um, curriculum and things that they are using so that we can teach our children um, in terms of their social emotional development. So while we've been out of school, um, people will say, well, kids, you know, they're missing out on mathematics or they didn't um, do all of the, the lessons that were required for them for coursework. What they're really learning or what they're really missing in that school environment is social emotional development. And we have to be extremely concerned about that during COVID-19. So that is, I mean, and I guess when you said soft skills, I think that probably definitely hit home to a lot of folks because we hear that. We hear people say, oh, this, these people don't have soft skills. Or, you know, back in the day, people say, oh, you know, people, they got book smarts, but no common sense. And, you, know, or, you know, there are things that aren't really uh, curriculum based, um, well, I won't say curriculum based, they're not like textbook taught, but they are very valuable skills for people to have. So I think that that helps people understand that. Um, and so I guess you gave a really good talk about how, you know, back in the 90s when we started hearing people saying about that, is, is that what really got people thinking, oh, this is a missing piece in our education system that we have to go back and start incorporating? Absolutely. So I think for me, I recall, and for some of you that are listening that have been in education a while, we started back in the late 80s, early 90s, teaching care education, right? So you guys remember that if any of you had um, children that were in school at that time. One of the things I know in Richland too, during that time, almost every school um, trained all of their teachers in character ed. So we would have um, the character ed trait for the week, um, integrity. So we were trying to teach and incorporate all of these things into our daily lessons. And one of the reasons for that was because we as a society were, we were evolving. We were evolving. And so technology was coming into play. Um, a lot of the engagement that happened between humans um, wasn't in place. Our kids were sitting in front of televisions. They were sitting in front of computers. Um, technology was becoming um, very, very prominent during that time. And so there was almost like a disconnect that was happening with people. And so all of a sudden we had um, zero tolerance for each other. We didn't have um, empathy. We didn't sympathize with other people. And so I think it kind of fed into the disconnect um, in society, it fed into um, what we're now seeing now in some of the discrimination and racism that's going on in our country. So I think we as educators knew that as those societal um, programs and systems, the rec centers, um, the community things that were happening, happening um, when they were um, no longer part of budgets, when we start pulling money out of communities, when there weren't activities for kids 
um, with rec centers, that kids were coming to school and they did not have um, those skill sets. And so as educators, it was great that I was teaching you how to do math, but if I couldn't teach you how to engage with your fellow student um, when y'all had a disagreement without slapping him upside his head, then we were definitely missing something. And so we started going down this trail, I think, to teach our children about character education. And so character education became big. That involved into um, what we called um, PBIS. So then schools started bringing in PBIS, which is positive behavior intervention systems. And so now it was, how do we get kids to sit still? How do we get them to behave? How do we get them to listen? And so we came up with what's called PBIS, and a lot of school districts across the country implemented PBIS in their schools. Well, the problem was um, when we implement, sometimes the implementation doesn't fully take place. And so it has evolved now into, now we're doing SEL, now we're doing restorative practices. So educators across the country are doing the work trying to figure out what do we need to do so that our students not just learn how to do math, but that our students learn how to be better people, that our students learn how to be better citizens, that they learn how to communicate, that they learn how to self-manage, that they learn empathy for other people. And so I think it has always been a part of education, but I think as society has changed, it has become more a responsibility for educators and for schools to help our students do this. So pre-COVID, like outside of now, um, what were schools doing? Like, how do you teach this curriculum? Is it just kind of in, in, the, in the course of talking about history, then you also point out this stuff? Or how is that, how is all these soft, soft skills taught in a curriculum? So this looks different all across the country. So I've had an opportunity to work with schools um, from the East Coast to the West Coast, um, North, South, in, um, and out of the country. And it all looks different. But most school districts at this point have a curriculum, right? And so one of the ways that they might um, choose to do this is to have social emotional learning as part of their daily schedule. So even in a virtual environment, school districts have a schedule. Um, where children are doing math, they're doing science. So the social emotional piece is a part of that curriculum. So it's a part of the schedule. However, to implement it and to, in, um, to engage students in it fully, um, which is really about student wholeness, to engage them fully is to make sure that it's inter intertwined into everything that you're doing. So I'm not just teaching you self-management um, in five minute time frame that I have, but I'm teaching you self management throughout the day, um, throughout the course of um, the time that you're in school. So there's always or should always be a focus on social emotional learning. So it's a part of a lesson, yes, that I might take time um, to focus on one particular aspect of it, but then it is also something I am teaching throughout the day. Um, throughout the time when I am teaching you math and science and social studies and any other subject um, that I'm teaching. Wow. So let me ask you this. So we and we talked about the COVID too. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I mean, school, students have been out of school for for five months. Um, even adults, we are having difficult time kind of dealing with it, managing. I, I hear it's funny when you say managing yourselves. Like I have a three-year-old who um, has painted on our walls. He has, he has um, pulled the string off of the blinds. I mean, we're dealing, we're dealing with a whole lot in here on uh, self-management that I'm sure he had a lot better in, in school. He doesn't have as much here. Um, so, so tell us, like, how is, you know, how can... Uh, I guess as we move forward, you know, whether you're doing virtual or, or anything else, how is that, how can social emotional learning and all that piece be incorporated into where we are now, especially with helping our kids cope with um, this crazy world we're living in right now? 
So I think one of the things that is extremely important is that parents communicate with their children. Children now, from the three-year-old that you're talking about to the 19, 25, 30-year-old that might still be living at home, are all experiencing um, this COVID-19 in a different way. Um, some of them are more traumatized than others. Um, some of them um, are dealing with it okay, but our children are being impacted by what is happening to them. So it is extremely important that we communicate so that we are aware of how it is they're processing. Um, are they um, struggling social emotionally with this situation? Well, certainly they are, adults are. And so they're talking about you know, adults that are going through depression, adults that are having anxiety. Um, those are certainly some of the same things that are going on with our kids. And so one of the things that you will hear um, over and over again when you talk to parents and you say, well, what should we do? You know, the kids, um, we want our kids to go back to school and we're looking at them like, what are you talking about? It's not safe. And the first thing they say is they need to be with their friends. They don't say anything about math. They don't say anything about, well, they need to more science, right? They need to be in school. But what they normally say is a response to them being in a social environment and how not being in that social environment is impacting them. And so I think that's the conversation that needs to be had with children. Now, we need to make it age appropriate. And so we need to have conversations and so that we understand how are they processing because they're being impacted. This is traumatizing. Um, this is traumatizing for the high school senior that didn't get to graduate. This is traumatizing, although we're finding other ways to celebrate it, kids that are having birthdays, kids that can't you know, hug their friends, kids that can't um, communicate and have that kind of connection. Um, that is traumatizing. And so to have conversations with our children about how they are, how are, how are they self-managing? Mm -hmm. We put them um, in front of a computer and all of a sudden the computer is full, right? How are they managing their time? How are they self-managing? How do they have the ability to process their thoughts and emotions around what's going on? And the only way that we can know that is to have conversations with them. But let me say this, because most parents, um, when we trying to have conversations with our kids, we like go in for the kill. That is not the way to do it, okay? Um, one of the things that is helpful is that you, you talk to them um, and you can have that conversation come off in um, terms of a role play, right? So, you know, what if you were talking to one of your friends? What would you tell them you were thinking about covert 19? Because there are some kids that they'll talk to everybody but their parents, right? Mm -hmm. so then who is the person in the family that they need to talk to? Because we have to have them process emotions. Emotions that are not processed stay with you, right? And so let me give you an example. Um, certainly you're married. Some of the people that are listening may be as well. If my husband and I have an argument in 2010 and the argument never gets resolved, we have an argument in 2015 that's very similar to the argument that we had in 2010, guess what happened? The argument that we had in 2010 is going to come back up five years later, right? And so the importance of helping them to process these emotions is extreme. Like we can't just, you know, act as if nothing's going on. It is, it is traumatic what it is that is happening with some of our kids. And just like adults, they all process differently. So we have to find out what it is. We also need to have real conversations with them. For our kids in particular, we need to talk to them about what's going, in, going on in society around 
discrimination and around racism and what this all means. Because our history, the history that they learned in school certainly didn't teach them. So they have no reference point for understanding all of this. And unless we taught them about African-American history and our challenges, they have no reference point for understanding this. So that explains for me all the anger. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids burning stuff up, a lot of kids destroying schools, why are they tearing down stores? They in Chicago and Louis Vuitton taking stuff and, and doing all of this because they don't know how to process. They don't know how to self-manage. They're not socially aware. They don't know how to, it's the social emotional things that they don't have. And so we cannot miss this moment to help our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you do have children who are not like, not real communicative, are there other things that as parents we need to be looking for um, yeah. in our children right now? Yes, so I'm not a psychologist, I'm an educator. However, um, whenever children are not communicating, um, behaviors are always um, a good indicator of kind of where they are, right? And so you know your children. We used to do, um, when, when I was a classroom teacher, we would stand at the door when our children came in school in the morning, right? And because we saw them every day, as soon as something didn't look right, we knew something was wrong. They didn't have to tell us, but we knew it was wrong. So pay attention to the behavior, pay attention to the moods, right? So one day you're like, hey, mommy, you know, da 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 da, -da, -da and you're going 100 miles an hour. And then the next day you're quiet as a mouse. So pay attention to the behavior, pay attention to how it is they're processing, pay attention to how much television, how much news they're listening to. We even have to govern that ourselves. How much are you listening to? How much are you processing? How much do you understand about what's really going on and what's being said? So I would say behavior is certainly an indicator um, that there could be something that's bothering them. Check out what they're doing, and it's always kind of tricky depending on what parent you're talking to. Check out what's going on on social media with them. Check out what friends they're engaging with um, and the conversations that they're having. And so pay attention to their behavior. Pay attention to their mood swings. Pay attention to how they're engaging if they have siblings. One day, you know, you're helpful and you want to do everything. And then the next day, you're like, leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. Um, pay attention to what's going on with their behavior. That's a great tip. Great tip. So um, other than that, I mean, I think actually those were some really good tips. But um, if if something happens, like say, you know, and I think most schools are going back initially starting virtually. Yeah, um, yeah. And then, you know, but the there's that phased in model to go back to school. Um, if they go back to school and then things get shut down and you and I talking about this offline that, you know, there's a school in Georgia that. 900 people are now in quarantine after six days of school. Um, so unfortunately, you know, there is a possibility that, you know, things go, they go back and then something happens. Um, is that kind of, I guess, I don't know if that would be considered trauma, but I would imagine that's some kind of, some level of trauma. Is that trauma, the start, start and stop, start and stop? Is that something that, um, parents need to be concerned about? And then if so, what are some of the things that we can help support them as we are into this uncertainty about whether or not school will happen face to face? So I think there's a couple of things. Of course, everything comes back for me um, in communication, right? We have to understand that even if the parent is saying, my child needs to go back to school, um, I need my child back in school, the I might be feeling afraid to go to school. What if I get sick? Mm -hmm. What if I die? Like people are dying. So we can't not have the conversation. But we as parents need to ensure that we are communicating to our children and our voice 
is the voice that we are hearing. Because what we're hearing on the news, what we're hearing people say is all doom and gloom, right? And so we have to be careful about what they're hearing. But at the same time, we need to know, we need to give them a voice. Make them feel, and that's part of creating an environment, we need to make them feel like I'm safe saying what it is I'm feeling. And I can say to my mom, Mom, I know you're saying we need to go back to school and maybe they even heard you say it. But I don't want to get sick. I don't want to make somebody sick. What if we go to school and somebody gets COVID and we have to shut down? What is the conversation then? And so it's important, I think, again, about the communication. I think it's very critical that we are communicating with our children. I do not understand for the life of me why my grandson was going to football practice. I was like, I don't get this. Like, I'm, I'm well, we're in small groups, and we're, I, mm -mm, I ain't feeling. It. I'm not, I'm not feeling this. Why is he at football practice, right? So I talked to my grandson, and I said, "Tell me about what's going on." And he said, "They did not want." And so these are the things that we don't always hear. Think about the children that are seniors in high school that's been playing football for the last three or four years and are possibly on a route to get a scholarship or to get accepted into a college. Now, some people might say, oh, no, that's no big deal. I still wouldn't let them go. But for a parent that can't pay for a child to go to college and they're going to get a free ride, that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. And all these conversations have to occur. They're all different based on our children, what the needs are in our family. So while it was, I don't understand why he needs to go, for another parent, they're saying, no, you need to go. You need to go back to school. But trauma is happening to our kids. And again, I'm not a psychologist, but part of the way that we communicate is helping kids to process trauma. We got to create an environment where they feel safe to say whatever it is they need to say. And then we have to listen to them. Listen to what they're saying. Ask the questions about how it is they're processing what's going on. We shouldn't just say, oh, my kids need to go back to school. I need to go to work, right? If your kids are old enough to have a conversation with, ask them, what do you think about going back to school? What do you think? And if they feel uncomfortable about it, as parents, it's our job to make sure that we instill hope, that we tell them, of course, people are getting sick. But guess what? There are a lot of people that are not getting sick. There are people that are dying, that is true. But there are a lot of people that are being healed from COVID. But we don't hear that message from all of the people that have gotten sick and passed away. There are at least five times many or six or seven times many that have gotten it and are healed. And so mm -hmm. we instill hope in them and not have them walk through this process in a, in a, in a, in a traumatized mindset. So we have to make sure we're careful that they're not replaying it in their mind. That when I hear about the school in Florida or I hear about the school in Georgia, my anxiety goes to another. So we have to be very, very careful about that. But they, yeah. they will tell you if you ask them, they need that social interaction. So we got to make sure they're engaged, even if it can't be person to person. So what are some of the ways that we can ensure that kind of engagement if they are, if they do remain virtual? If they remain virtual, one of the things that's key, and I would hope that at some point, even if your children are in school virtual, at some point you'll end up behind them in the chair, listening to what's going on, <laughs> right? 
And so I think it's important that we know that the teachers themselves and this particular organization has laid out a blueprint um, for how it is we need to engage even more with students during this time, not less. So my child is in a virtual environment having school, um, is the teacher engaging them in conversations about how they're doing? Is the teacher working to try to get the kids um, still connected and feel a sense of community? And so that's part of their social emotional learning. And so no teacher at this time um, should be processing in their thoughts that, okay, well, we got to get to the lesson, but I want to know what's going on with my kids. So I want to talk with my children. I want to say, hey, how's it going? We're still trying to find kids that didn't have internet connection, that didn't have iPads. Um, so we're still working hard across the, the nation, I hope, trying to look for those children. But for the children that are engaged, we can never get to the heart of children if all we care about is whether or not they, they learn a math lesson. Um, and I once said it best, no one will care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it just basically boils down to that. We still have to make them have and feel a sense of community. So even in a virtual environment, I can still do a check-in, right? So when I'm doing virtual training with teachers all over or principals all over, I don't go in and say, oh, so today we're going to be facilitating this training. I'm like, no. Guys, tell me how you're doing on a scale of 1 to 10. How you feeling? Give me a thumbs up. You know, give me one word. Because I need to check where people are. That's going to help me to engage them better in the process. But I cannot overlook the fact that the social emotional learning of students is being impacted on a major scale. And if we miss it, our children are going to struggle. They're going to struggle academically, but they're also going to struggle with some of these other things. So there are things that parents can do at home to help and to monitor um, whether or not their children um, are socially aware. Are you aware of the impact that these conversations around discrimination and racism. Again, we have to make those conversations age appropriate. You know, we can't, you know, have a conversation with a three-year-old um, about discrimination and they certainly don't understand, but they understand um, colors, so they understand black and white. They understand um, how it is you make a choice over one thing over another. So you can always make the conversation appropriate for the children. But communication is key. We have to talk to our kids so that we know where they are and how they're processing what's going on. That's very true. I've been trying to do that, like talking and then just doing activities like let's go outside, yeah. you know, let's take a break. And, and so that's been helpful. So I want to hear about I mean, there's been a lot of discussion just about education and how we're doing things different. Tell us, what is this coordinator of student wellness that she'll be doing for Baltimore City Schools? So I am so, so, so excited. So the coordinator um, of student wholeness actually has to do with um, social emotional learning. So for all of the schools um, in the system, um, there are requirements, I could say, um, for schools to create, first of all, climate and culture. Well, certainly we're not in a building, so how do you create climate and culture um, in a virtual environment? Well, certainly every child um, in your classroom, online or in front of you, um, should certainly have a sense of, as I said earlier, um, a sense of community. And so caring about how these children are developing, so that student wholeness is really about how do we develop the whole student, right? So yes, we're concerned about the math. Yes, we're concerned about language arts, um, science and social studies, but I'm more concerned about the social emotional learning of the child. And so it's creating this environment 
through the way that the teacher engages with the students. So that we're training and teaching social emotional learning, um, that we're doing what's called restorative practices, um, that we are creating environments where all students um, have equitable access um, to what it is we're doing. And so how mm -hmm. do I, as the educator, um, create this space where all of my kids um, get the same opportunities. So let me say this, um, Tamika, because I wanted to um, put this out there. I think it's extremely important because I believe there's a group of students that while all of our students are being impacted and all of them will um, at some point or another get um, opportunities around social emotional learning, there is a group of students that this is even more critical for, and that's our students um, that fall in the special education spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, those students, it is um, amazing to me um, how school districts and educators are planning to try to support um, the students that are in um, special education, no matter what um, ability um, that they lack and what it is they're trying to do. But I think it is critical um, for these kids because a lot of what it is they do with them um, is around social emotional learning. And so I think it is, um, the challenge, if there is one, is how do we as school districts um, support those kids? Mm -hmm. um, and so social emotional learning um, is what student wholeness is about. Um, how do we um, help the whole child? How do we support them? Um, how do we support the parents um, in helping them? Um, and so what that looks like in a virtual environment, um, we're even having to um, do training um, and different engagement with our parents. Um, because some of our parents don't know how to support um, students in a virtual learning environment. For mm -hmm. some of our parents, um, they are seeing um, something that has never happened to their child. And so how do we continue to support them? Um, and so that's really what student wholeness is about. Um, but I work with um, teachers um, and school leaders creating these teams of social emotional learning um, teams that assist schools um, doing training um, teachers in the curriculum um, going in and we'll be doing it in a virtual environment um, going in um, and supporting teachers and how to engage students um, in social emotional learning I actually have um, two actually I have three um, we're doing round tables um, round table talks with our principals this week um, around how it is to engage um, their staff and then to for the staff to engage the students um, to make sure that they are social and emotionally well. Um, because aside from that, I don't know that the math means anything. If they're social and emotionally well. And that's, I mean, to me, that's the, that's the crux of all of this. Like, you know, yes, we're concerned um, you know, test scores and all the other things that go along with um, academic growth, but we can't put academic growth over here and then take social emotional learning and put it here. Um, they have to come together. And that's what student wholeness is about. How do we help the whole child? Um, and not to take one thing and put it as a priority over the other, but how do we take all of those and put them together and help our students? So is this like kind of a new concept and it, it did the Maryland like de, did Maryland set that as a standard or is this something that the Baltimore City Schools created themselves? Actually, it's not. So you will find school districts across the country um, who have made it a priority um, that this is part of how they operate. Um, and so it may show up in different school systems as different positions. Um, for example, um, some of them may very well still fall under um, PBIS, positive behavior intervention. They may have um, a coordinator or somebody at their district office. Um, some of them do have um, offices um, that 
that work is around social emotional learning and PBIS and restorative practices and all those things fall under that office. Um, so in Baltimore City, they have an office um, called the Office of Student Wholeness. And so there's actually a whole staff, um, the executive director, the ex director, coordinators, coaches, um, because we were certainly um, clear about what it is our students needed. Um, but all across the country, you will find different positions. Um, in Charlotte Mecklenburg School, I think last year they um, did coordinators for restorative practices. So they have an office of uh, staff that do social emotional learning. They have an office of staff that does restorative practices training, and they collaborate in the work that they do in supporting students. And so it's not um, a new concept. Again, in most school districts, you'll find that things look different. But even here in Columbia, Richland 1, Richland 2, Lex 2, all of them have done training in the last three or four years around restorative practices. And so they do have um, staff and teachers um, that are concerned about the environment and creating the right environment for kids. Um, and helping kids to develop social and emotionally. And so it looks different everywhere. You know, it might be a different name or different title to it. Um, but all of, I think, everything around education right now um, has to be, because of where we are as a society, has to be concerned about the whole child. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the academics. It can't be. Right. It can't be. Our children, especially now, if never before, especially now, with all that is going on in our country, we have to be concerned about how our children are developing socially, emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially like you said, I mean, it, it, there, there's the COVID, but then there's also mm -hmm. everything about racial justice that we're going on. There's a lot um, today. Um, I, I chaired a, a affordable housing task force committee. And of course we talked yeah. about, you know, the level of, um, of evictions that they're thinking that are coming forward. So, you know, you've got children who are dealing with homelessness and financial strife within their homes. And so there's so many things that kids have to deal with. Um, so before we close out, let me ask you, are there other, um, as, as non-educators, are there other resources for yeah. parents or community leaders on, because even and when I say that parents, but I said before, not even if you don't have to have a child, I know there are so many folks who are now in the community working with different groups wanting to be there for kids. I think yeah. we're finally going back to believing that it takes a village to raise a child. And so... For adults, what are what are some of the resources that we can educate ourselves on how to support the whole child? And so I would certainly point everyone um, to go to the CASEL website, and it's actually the acronym uh, for the collaborative. It's called the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, CASEL, C-A-S-E-L. Their entire blueprint, all of the strategies around social emotional learning are there. There are activities there. There are information. There is information um, for parents and teachers. And um, as you said, just those that are trying to help and to understand what it is our children are going through. And so for um, anyone that is interested, um, I want them to um, that collaborative research because um, everything that they do certainly is research based. Um, they work with school districts across the country. Um, and so I would definitely point everyone in the direction um, to go to the CASEL, C-A-S-E-L um, website, the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. Um, and there are tons of resources available there. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm so proud of you because I guess it's been two years, two years now that you've officially um, been had new directions and you're in the city. I know you primarily work with um, school districts. Are there any other what are the other resources? What does new directions do if people uh, feel like they need other resources, especially I don't know if you saw last night I spoke to a, a lady who 
uh, a parent who homeschools. And so no. I know there are a lot of parents who are just thinking, even if they're not going to homeschool, they're now that they've experienced these last few months of uh, doing school at home, they have decided I've got to be more engaged because I don't know. So what are the resources that New Directions does and how can people uh, get keep in touch with you and, and, and tap you for a resource? And certainly I am open um, to anyone who is interested um, in trying to figure out how to support their children, um, even in terms of academics. New Directions um, primarily um, does work with school teachers and school districts, um, training and coaching teachers um, and facilitating with sort of practices and social emotional learning, um, creating school climate and culture. Um, but parents um, that are interested in finding additional resources for their children, um, there's a community of educators um, who are offering um, online um, tutoring and support for students. Um, certainly, I can put you in that direction if that's something that you're in need of. Um, some of our children, even with the virtual learning, um, are still struggling academically. Um, and so please um, find my website, um, Directions215, um, Facebook, New Directions215. Um, um, if you Google my name, you'll find me, um, Beverly Manigo. Um, please feel free. Um, I am open to providing um, any resource um, that is needed to help our parents, um, to help our children. And even if there are educators out there um, that have not been trained in social emotional learning, or this is um, for some reason the first time you're hearing about what sort of practices or anything that I mentioned, um, please reach out to me um, so that we can share um, information in terms of um, training and doing what's best for our students. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I thank you so much for your time. This has been great. And I've learned a lot. I'm just, I've, I'm going to check out um, the website that you were talking about. I think um, yes. just as we, as we not even just transition back to school, but you know, there are so much that happens in our world. I mean, you know, from, you know, school shootings to, you know, racial um, issues. I mean, there's just, it seems like kids today, I think, just deal with so much more than, you know, I did when I was younger, you did when you were younger. And, and I think that we, it's incumbent upon all of us to just educate ourselves more and more about how can we be totally supportive of these young people so that they can cope so that they can have resources um, so that we can educate ourselves on how to support them further. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, but um, so thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. It was um, a pleasure being here. And I tell people as always, if you end up watching the replay and you have a question, uh, put type it in the chat and I'll make sure I get it to Beverly and she can answer your questions. But uh, tomorrow night, um, join me this, like I said, it's education week. So tomorrow night, Join me tomorrow at 7 p.m. for a conversation with uh, Chandra Jefferson, um, who is South Carolina Teacher of the Year for 2020. And she's going to talk about education, everything. She's going to talk about serving on Accelerate SC. Um, she's going to talk about her new fellowship, where she was at, but she's going to spend the next year in D.C. Um, advocating on, on um, Capitol Hill for education issues. And um, she, of course, as an advocate for teachers, um, has some concerns about how we op safely reopen schools. And so we're going to talk about all that with her tomorrow. So uh, join me tomorrow for community, another community conversation. I'm Tamika Isaac Devine. Until next time, good night and God bless. <laughs>